Thank you for joining us today. We will begin shortly. We're just waiting for attendees to make their way into the main Zoom space. Thank you. Hello and welcome for joining us. I am Gina Neff and I'm the executive director of the Mindrew Center for Technology and Democracy and welcome to our latest event here at the center at the University of Cambridge. Before I introduce our guests tonight, I wanna let you know that this event is being professionally live human captioned. If you'd like to have captioning, you can select it using the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And we want to thank Tara for providing the captions today. Additionally, a stream text captioning for this event is also available. This is a fully adjustable live transcription of the event in your browser. If you want to open this, we're sharing the link to that stream text now. And a transcript of this event will be made available online afterwards. Now, before we begin, some points of housekeeping. Um, the event will be recorded by Zoom and streamed to an audience on the platform. By attending the event, you are giving your consent to be included in this recording. The recording will be available on the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy and CRASH websites shortly after the event. Our guests tonight will speak, for us, uh, speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for discussion and take questions from the audience. You can use the Q&A function in the, in the toolbar for this. Um, questions can be asked through that, and we'll share those questions during the cons uh, discussion. Please don't share the questions during the chat or in the chat, um, in, use the, use the Q&A function bar. Um, we'd very much appreciate if you could complete a short survey after the event. Um, that feedback is very helpful for us as we do our events, and the link will be sent via Eventbrite. And please follow us and tag us on all of your favorite social media platforms. Um, we are on Twitter at, at @mctdcambridge, for example if you are live tweeting tonight's event. So um, with that, it is my great privilege and pleasure um, to introduce my colleague, Hunter Vaughn, 
Um, and tonight we are joined by Lisa Parks. Hunter is a senior research associate here at the Menderu Center for Technology and Democracy. He is an environmental scholar and a cultural historian focusing on the relationship between digital technologies, the environment, um, social justice, democratic agency, and infrastructures. Um, he's currently co-PI on a project on sustainable subsea networks funded through the Internet Society Foundation and a co-PI on an AHRC funded project, Global Green Media Network. Um, Dr. Vaughn's also co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Environmental Media, and he his latest book is Hollywood's Dirtiest Secret, The Hidden Environmental Costs of Movies. Um, we're pleased to have Hunter here, and Hunter will um, in, introduce Lisa. Now turn it over to him. Great. Thank you, Gina. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks to the team for organizing it, uh, this event. And of course, mostly thank you, Lisa, for taking the time to share uh, your expertise uh, and your research with us. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where people are. Uh, I am thrilled, um, very pleased to have, be joined today by Lisa Parks, um, who is one of the great trailblazers in the subfield of environmental media studies, as well as really emergent uh, research and scholarship and thinking at the intersection of technology and social justice. Um, excuse me, Lisa Parks is a distinguished professor of media studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. She is the author of Rethinking Media Coverage, Vertical Mediation and the War on Terror, Cultures in Orbit, Satellites in the Televisual and, and Mixed Signals, Media Infrastructures and Globalization, which is currently in progress. She's also the co-editor of Signal Traffic, Critical Studies of Media Infrastructures, Life in the Age of Drone Warfare, and Down-to-Earth Satellite Technologies, Industries, and Cultures, among other books. She has been a PI on major grants from the National Science Foundation and the US State Department and is committed to exploring how greater understanding of media and communication systems can assist citizens, scholars, and policymakers to advance campaigns for technological literacy, creative expression, social justice, and human rights. Uh, Dr. Parks directs the Global Media Technologies and Cultures Lab at UCSB and is a 2018-2018 MacArthur Fellow. Um, it is always a delight uh, to be in conversation with you, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I will. I look forward to um, joining the conversation with you in a bit. And in the meantime, I'll be watching the Q&A bar uh, for any questions from the audience so that we can engage a wider conversation. But for now, I happily turn it over to you. Thank you, Hunter. And thank you also to Gina and the Menderu Center and to Jeremy too for, for helping out. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, so hopefully this will work out. Can you all see that okay? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is presenting some work in progress, um, and it is really some of the excerpts of the introduction to a book that I'm working on called Mixed Signals, Media Infrastructures and Globalization. And so let me just get started. Uh, with sorry, this. sorry, Lisa, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We can't see your screen yet. Oh, I'm sorry. And I didn't want you to <laughs> continue you. all the way through. Thank you for telling me. Thinking that okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Hopefully you can see um, now, right? Is that better? All good. It's great. Okay, Thank you. Great. All right. So just starting off again, um, this will be a um, some excerpts from an introduction of a book that I'm uh, working on right now. So I'll just get started. The term mixed signals generally refers to a condition in which a communicator sends a message that is somehow contradictory, misleading, or confusing. The receiver typically tries to parse or clarify the message, but often the condition of contradiction persists. Some might say that all communication is ultimately about mixed signals. In this book, I mobilize this generic meaning 
to evoke a variety of conditions related to the current conjuncture of media globalization. First, I use the term mixed signals to point to the materialities modern, uh, of modern media as electronics and focus on technologies of media distribution. Second, I use the term to call attention to the multiple and overlapping satellite footprints, wireless coverage zones, and cloud regions that crisscross and reconstitute the Earth's surface as expansive signal territories. Third, the term is helpful in pointing to the contradictory messages publics receive from states and companies about media systems and services. Increasingly in these messages, public equals auctioned, free speech equals capture, participation equals surveillance, services equals traps, and so on. Fourth, the term mixed signals registers the rich heterogeneity of media content forms and formats in circulation and the possibilities of assembling, combining, and remixing them within affective media economies. Finally, mixed signals hints at the productive ambivalences and frictions within scholarly understandings of the terms media, mediation, and media globalization. This book sets out to engage these issues by investigating media infrastructures in post-war, post-socialist, and post-colonial contexts. The book suggests that those who have grown accustomed to ubiquitous high-speed connectivity and media abundance have much to learn about media technologies from those beyond the world's political, economic, and cultural capitals. In case studies presented in this book, People have sorted through the ruins of war to rebuild media after socialist broadcast and telecom systems were bombed from above. They have oscillated between fraying colonial telecom infrastructures and emergent systems of neoliberal platform capitalism. And they have drawn on local resources, knowledge, and labor to create their own links to the global media economy often after being ignored for decades by state and commercial providers. Because people in the outskirts often inhabit remote areas with smaller populations and limited incomes, they are overlooked and deemed politically, economically, and technologically, quote, insignificant by states and media and telecom companies. As I demonstrate throughout this book, however, People in such communities create media technologies and distribution practices that challenge contemporary mappings of world media systems, disrupt knowledge hierarchies around the technological, confront energy scarcity and other ecological matters, and help to produce and sustain media economies that support local cultures and laborers. This book redirects the study of media globalization away from media capitals and toward uh, the outskirts. The term outskirts, outskirt refers to quote, an outer border or fringe, an area on the outer edge, especially of a town, city or district, end quote. The word can function as a noun, usually pluralized, a verb or an adjective. The OED traces its use as a noun back to 1633, to characterize the positions of families and areas relative to the state of Ireland. By 1835, the adjective was used to characterize, quote, less, less civilized outskirt nations, end quote, of the British Empire. The term has since been used to refer to an area that exists beyond, yet around or adjacent to another. Often the term is connotatively associated with disenfranchisement, poverty, neglect, or informality, though not always. By the 1990s, use of the verb to outskirt meant to outmaneuver. Thus, outskirt is a multivalent signifier associated with dynamic acts of border inquiry and boundary making, as well as the imaginaries and politics of borrowing, sharing borrowing, sharing, reinventing, bypassing, and outdoing. By exploring media distribution on the outskirts, this study builds on scholarly, 
critiques of centralization in media studies. These critiques call out the, quote, myth of the mediated center, which Nick Coldry reminds us, quote, is always a construction. Its imaginary spatial form conflicts with the very different form that the media's spatial operations actually take, end quote. Coldry uses the concept of scatter to suggest that media processes can be understood as, quote, a world with many centers that produce and distribute media messages, end quote. Critiques of, media cent of the media center also recognize the importance of what Christina Venegas calls, quote, thinking regionally, while at the same time complicating the area studies paradigm, which as Ray Chow has argued, tends to reify and reinforce the superpowers world carving and organization of the planet into post-World War II, quote, spheres of influence. The question is how to conduct research and write in a way that evokes the relational, unpredictable, and power-laden dynamisms and materialities of media globalization. This cannot be reduced to the study of macro level and international flows or patterns across national contexts, tracking of powerful multinational conglomerates or analysis of cultural policies that many people are either unaware of, exploited by, or refuse to abide by. Though such work is, is important, there is also a need for more basic research on the everyday conditions in which people in different parts of the world live, work, and think with media technologies. Such research is often carried out by anthropologists and ethnographers who have generated a rich and extensive body of research on uses of media and information technologies in particular cultural contexts. Certainly there are overlaps between research on media in anthropology and film and media studies, but there are differences in training critical dispositions and purpose as well. As a post-structuralist feminist, I was trained to question the foundational assumptions of Western anthropology and reflect upon the power differentials inherent in conducting transcultural research. I learned from feminist post-colonial critics to approach research as a process of unlearning, listening, and critical reflexivity rather than aspire toward longitudinal immersion or mastery. Because of this, I have tried to formulate understandings of media technologies and globalization that are grounded in partiality rather than embedded in universalizing perspectives and ontological claims about media and technology. I've adopted a site-specific idiosyncratic and relational approach to investigate media infrastructures and globalization in part because nation states, companies, and regulators have not shown much evidence that their priority is to support diverse publics. Rather than learn about media infrastructure from the centers of power then, I try to understand it from an array of particular perspectives. In this book, I approach the concepts of global media and media globalization as sites of problematization and critical inquiry rather than as givens. And I'm inspired by the work of feminist theorists, Ender Paul Grewal and Carolyn Kaplan, who in their path-breaking collection, Scattered Hegemonies, conceptualized the transnational in ways that challenge Eurocentric and colonialist perspectives and suggest the need instead to explore various players and relations across different contexts. Their conceptualization of transnational sets out, quote, to problematize a purely locational politics of global, local, or center periphery in favor of the lines cutting across them. As feminists who note the absence of gender issues in all of these world system theories, we have no choice but to challenge what we see as inadequate and inaccurate binary divisions, end quote. Their work insists on the possibilities of reading and drawing relations of power across disparate sites rather than seeking to fit them into a rationalized world system or order. By invoking the outskirts as an organizing principle of the study, 
I do not mean to fetishize or exoticize the peripheries or margins or to prioritize relations of space over time. Rather, I critique the tendency of global media research to privilege formalized national frameworks and corporate brands, international flows, capital concentrations, and unidirectional models of technological innovation and diffusion, and, and in the process to exclude most of the world's people. While, is it, while it is essential to track those in power and try to understand their strategies and impact, researchers often ignore most people's everyday experiences with media technologies. Given this, my approach is in dialogue with recent work um, such as Jenna Burrell's work on invisible users, quote unquote, invisible users, and R Ramon Labato and Julian Thomas's work on, quote, informal media economies, as well as research on race, class, and or gender and technology by scholars such as Ruha Benjamin and Clapperton Muhanga. Yet the designation of mediated domains or practices as visible or invisible, formal or informal, tends to diminish the value of people's labor and creativities from the get-go by casting them within an economic or industrial model, when in fact their contributions may assume different dimensions, whether epistemological, sociocultural, educational, or ecological. Building on research on informal media, there is a need to expand the critical awareness of and vocabulary for the uneven material conditions, varied socio-technical relations and diverse epistemologies that shape people's knowledges and experiences of media technologies. People's media experiences, I argue, cannot be reduced to national systems, media capitals, or area studies approaches. They demand more situated phenomenological and conceptual approaches that recognize everyday social struggles, agencies, and creativities, which are vital to understandings of media globalization, the processes and practices by which media materialize in diverse sites around the world. Far from being mere endpoints, terminals, or last mile solutions, technologies of media distribution are embedded in local epistemologies and practices of everyday life. And rather than embrace, embrace Western philosophical understandings of quote, media and quote, technology that are often built upon universalizing assumptions, I understand media technologies as socio-technical relations and situated knowledges that are contingent upon the dynamic, diverse, and differential material conditions of everyday life. Media technologies, in other words, are not simply tools that showcase varying degrees of human virtuosity, ingenuity, or industrial advancement. They are not metrics or indices of human capacity, progress, development, or efficiency. Rather, media technology sh takes shape within specific territorial and cultural contexts and become part of particular individuals and communities, attempts to process, participate in, and interpret the complex planetary conditions in which we live. And while there's an exciting uh, turn in the field to broaden the conceptualization of media and mediation to include geologies, oceanic fluidities, air, atmospheres, and other elemental media, in this book, I approach media for the most part as electronic or digital audiovisual content. I, I think there's so much to learn about the ways such content has taken shape and been distributed in various parts of the world. I'm really skipping around here in the introduction. So there are large stretches that I'm not going into. So I apologize if it's a little disjointed, but now I'm going into another section here. Um, so my goal in this book is to offer insights based on research across disparate sites that enables unlearning of dominant assumptions that are lodged in quote, global media and or quote, media globalization. The outskirts then can be thought of as a scattering of sites and socio-technical relations brought together for critical analysis. 
this, the selection of these sites has been guided by a feminist politics of positionality and partiality. The book's case studies took shape largely through professional and personal relationships across multiple sites, both in person and in online for over a decade. And research on one topic in one site or with one collaborator often generated questions, encounters, or opportunities that led to another. Rather than dismiss these research paths as too personal, happenstance, or nonsensical, I embrace this idiosyncratic process as a critical practice or method of discovery. This study is thus also an experiment in method, how to study globalization and media infrastructure in ways that are attuned to the durational, multi-sided and interventionist potentials of media research. Case studies emerge on the outskirts as gatherings, threaded themes and layers, as research conducted in a splintering of directions rather than a linear path. And because of this, what follows is a much more a mediated pluriverse, uh, building on Arturo Escobar's evocative term, as it is a rendering of media globalization. I'm going to read you a little bit from a section in the intro called Energizing Media. So when thinking about the term media globalization, it's important to recognize the variable material circumstances in which media consumers live. Most people in the world do not have access to ubiquitous broadband internet and grid power. These conditions must inform how scholars think about media globalization. Historically, those in rural communities have relied on the wealth generated by local agricultural cooperatives to subsidize local media and link to national and global systems. In communities in Southern and Eastern Africa, for instance, costs of media access, consumption, and or participation are often contingent upon the sale of crops, such as corn, soybeans, and sunflowers. And because of this, agricultural and other resources remain integral to the study of media globalization. State and commercial providers often fail to extend media infrastructure and services to remote areas with smaller population densities since it is deemed to be not politically or economically profitable. In these contexts, agricultural economies serve as the support structures of media technologies. At the same time, big tech companies make constant promises regarding their efforts to provide global connectivity. Not only have Facebook and WhatsApp and now TikTok become primary media infrastructures in much of the world, but owners of new asynchronous satellite constellations such as SpaceX and OneWeb have tried to pick up where state and private terrestrial providers have left off, targeting rural low-income communities and promising to, quote, serve the underserved or the so-called, quote, bottom billion who lack internet con connectivity. And thus far, the underserved users of these new satellite constellations have included wealthy yacht owners underway at sea and in need of broadband, not those who lack internet and media services altogether. Just because corporations celebrate technologies of global connectivity and promotions does not mean that their service provision actually occurs. The question is, how do we critique entities and structures of power and domination in processes of media globalization while also holding on to the power to imagine and recreate these technologies and everyday relations in situated contexts? A key factor that present, prevents universal service provision is the dependence on modern me of modern media on electricity. To participate in media culture, most people in the world cannot simply plug their devices into the wall. They must constantly think about how and where to get an electrical charge and to charge their devices. And they must plan for this in daily life. Thus, there is an added labor and time involved in people's efforts to consume, produce, or share media. These conditions have resulted in local informal economies of cheap energy-related equipment, including solar panels, 
batteries, power banks, adapters, and cables, which people use to build systems to charge their devices, receive signals and data, and consume and share media. Such energy practice seem almost inconceivable to many consumers and scholars in post-industrial Western contexts who enjoy steady flows of grid power and high-speed network services. Those who live in conditions of energy surplus have much to learn from those who contend with daily energy scarcity. Uh, for these consumers have a much stronger sense of constraints, limits, and priorities. Given concerns about the global climate, climate crisis, it is not viable or conscionable to continue operating and using media infrastructures and devices guided by mindsets and practices of energy surplus. Each text, message, phone call, Google search, social media post, streamed HD movie or Twitch session requires energy and therefore contributes in some way to climate disruption. Should we move toward device use standards for individual, organizational, national internet that are not just geared toward limiting screen time for public health purposes, but toward reducing energy expenditures and environmental impacts? The emergent field of environmental media studies is beginning to address, address such questions, but there is also a need to recognize that people, who, people around the world who have by necessity adopted sustainable, sorry, let me start that sentence over. <laughs> uh, th there's a need to recognize that people around the world who have by necessity adopted sustainable or practices long before it registered as a critical concern in Western academic contexts. So I'm just suggesting that there have been these sustainable practices among um, people who live in conditions of energy scarcity for a long time, but they're often just completely overlooked by a lot of their work in environmental media studies. So scholarship that sets out to de-westernize or decolonize media studies does, does not idly assume everyone in the world needs network connectivity to thrive politically, economically, and culturally. Rather, such research carefully considers the socio-historical conditions and agencies, that is, the imaginaries, desires, and interests of diverse peoples. While it is vital for media globalization researchers to investigate and analyze global media conglomerates for big tech companies, scholars cannot become intellectually beholden to or enraptured by these companies and their operations alone. Echoing Donna Haraway, it matters where we conduct our research, what we choose to focus on or not, which material conditions we explore, and what conceptual frameworks we rely on, as they will shape and inform scholarly understandings, in this case of media globalization. Moreover, there are trade-offs in the ways that research on media globalization can emerge and take shape. For instance, engaging with one national or local context over a long period of time may generate deeper or more nuanced cultural understandings and insights. Conducting research transnationally, on the other hand, in and across different locales may build limited yet more relational understandings. Both approaches can aid in grasping the complex dynamics and material materialities of media globalization and infrastructure. This study of media globalization values the particular over the universal and the idiosyncratic over the systematic. It represents a shift away from state systems and corporate brands and towards situated studies of socio-technical relations in different contexts. And the goal is not to explore how powerful Western forces of globalization are localized and hybridized or glocalized, but rather to listen to and learn from creators, inventors, and users of media technologies on the outskirts and offer critical insights, concepts, and mode of understanding based on those engagements. Then I have a very final short section just to kind of talk a little bit about how, um, how I do this work. Um, so in efforts to delve, I'm almost done, like maybe two to three more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. In efforts to delve into the issues discussed above, I've been experimenting with research on 
media infrastructures for almost two decades, kind of embarrassing to say, <laughs> time flies. Um, the book is about that process of experimentation and what I've learned. And, and the research has involved using network maps, field work, interviews, and photography to explore material conditions around particular facilities, installations, nodes, and communities. These sites include um, earth stations and cell towers, broadcast transmitters, and data centers. And, and um, sorry, I think I missed, okay. When at infrastructure sites, I ask basic questions, even if answering them is not always straightforward. What is it? Who owns it? How long has it been here? What was here before? Who owns the land? What kinds of materials and equipment are here? How did they get here? Who brought them? How long did it take to build the site? Who does it serve? What is it connected to? Who operates, maintains, and repairs and secures it? How is it related to other systems of energy, water, and transportation? And this approach emerged out of the recognition that I was socialized not to know about the infrastructures which I and other people around the world use daily and subsidize. Studying infrastructure then involves studying, at least for me, it involves studying what I was socialized not to know about and trying to find a language for making sense of it. In my work as a media scholar, I have tried to adopt an infrastructural disposition and engage with infrastructural materialities and outskirts, not as givens, but as sites of opacity, difference, relationality, and power that demand investigation, specification, and analysis. I sought to create research approaches that were more vernacular, ad hoc, and experimental. And these approaches involve learning through my own phenomenological engagements, embracing feelings of strangeness and incomprehension, learning from people who live in the vicinity of infrastructural and media objects and collaborating with users, scholars, and artists in different cultural contexts. Based on this empirical research, I've been trying to formulate um, ideas about what media infrastructure is and how it takes shape and becomes meaningful across these contexts. Findings have led me to question the accuracy of network maps face the complex biospheres and geopolitics that infrastructures are entangled with and register the various kinds of informal labor required to sustain vast layered systems. Um, I Sometimes people quote uh, Lee Starr about infrastructure being the boring stuff and uh, I appreciate her remark, but I also feel that infrastructure is only boring if we idly accept or normalize static ways of mapping, perceiving or understanding it. And so I will end there. And um, uh, this is just kind of, you know, I have in this in the book uh, quite a few different case studies uh, that I go into, and I haven't had a chance to do that in this short talk today. But hopefully, maybe it has piqued your curiosity, and you'll uh, you'll follow when this comes out. But I just want to say thank you there. I'm going to end end my talk. Thanks. I'll stop sharing today. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the Q&A function is open if you want to add any questions. Uh, I have a few that I'm happy to, to get started with. And if that doesn't take us many hours into the future, then yeah, we'll definitely uh, try to make time or we'll definitely make time uh, to come back for any of the audience questions and, and comments. We'd love to get everyone out there more involved in this. Um, I was, I had like, I had an order of questions uh, based on sort of content and methods that I wanted to ask, but because of the way you ended, I figure I will reverse that and start at the last thing that you spoke of, uh, which involves the methods um, of this multi-decade existential adventure, um, which I appreciate both as not at all boring and also uh, the way that I think a sort of personal life investment in scholarship should actually be structured. So I, I applaud that commitment um, and longevity. You do a, you're working you're working with a lot of stuff here uh, and trying to balance, as you put it, ways of coming up with language to render legible, to render visible, to to render 
sort of com comprehensible, I guess, or comprehensive, these things that we are socially trained not to see, socially trained not to talk about, um, but also you work with communities that, as you put it, are, you know, historically or conventionally meant to be seen on the outskirts or in the periphery of, of mainstream tech power, economic power, but also to a degree research uh, focus, which, you know, as you pointed out, global media studies has a particular, its fetishes for big corporate, for, for big power, for the larger infrastructural players and things like that. Um, over the last few years, we have in research seen a big shift in funding and, and emphasis uh, on to working with communities, working with marginalized groups, working with underrepresented stakeholders uh, and, and people, which always carries with it the challenge and even the danger of further extracting knowledge and time um, and, and different types of sort of academic or, or value or capital from those groups. And so I'm wondering, both in terms of your interdisciplinary forays uh, into working across sort of anthropology, STS, media studies, and the humanities and the arts, um, but also in terms of your working directly uh, with, you know, communities in Zambia or Tanzania. Um, what have been some of the challenges? What have you found out really was an asset or, or a beneficial tool or a successful approach to trying to maintain that sense of appreciation, respect, and um, empowerment of, of the communities uh, that, that you're working with? Yeah, it's, it's an important question. It's something that I think about a lot, how to, like, what what kind of relationship um, as a researcher is appropriate to have with communities when doing research um, in their milieu. Um, I have tended to believe that it is better to engage with communities, even though it may reiterate and reproduce particular kinds of Western tropes. Um, rather than occupy a position of isolationism. Um, I, I'm willing to risk those potential uh, critiques because I find that I unlearn so much of my Western training and my Western um, proclivities when I engage with diverse communities in different contexts that I feel like I'm unraveling my own education in a way and reconstituting myself each time I have an opportunity to do field-based community research, um, especially in communities that are rural uh, and um, relatively economically disenfranchised. Um, I grew up more in a kind of working class environment. And I think I just was a little more hardwired to be interested in um, how people make do and use um, the material resources they have around them in everyday life. And I think I share that um, even though I grew up in North America and I, I have, I'm much more in a situation of affluence um, my class background is a little bit more in line with some of the making do that I see. And so um, I, I, I guess I'm just trying to get at this issue of, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not an anthropologist, therefore I cannot do field-based research. Well, I am not an anthropologist to be sure, but I am a media scholar who's really interested in understanding how these technologies are materialized, used, and thought about in diverse contexts in different um, parts of the world. And so I've tried to figure out a way to formulate partial understandings of these issues through those engagements. And um, I do try to, in my writing, um, emphasize ideas like situated knowledge and the partiality and positionalities and limits of my own um, insights and contributions as well. So it might be a little long-winded answer to your question, but there, it, it's worth a whole seminar on this topic, I think. Um, so thanks for bringing it up. 
That's it's worth many seminars, actually. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, I think is an ongoing challenge for anyone that wants to do research in this field ethically and not from a, as you put it, isolationist perspective. Um, just to sort of carry to to extend that, did you find like did you find certain methods sort of participatory uh, structuring of research or community based activities? That you you know seem to help really build senses of community agency. Um, can you share any particular examples, or is this a read the book answer? No, 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 no. Yeah, so I, I, that was another part of your question. I think um, so. In some uh, in some circumstances, as part of this research, I did bring students with me, and we did either workshops or community tech projects. Um, sometimes we would come collaborate with computer scientists who are network engineers. That's what we did in Macha Zambia. And my part of the team would do interviews with people about what they thought about internet services and mobile phone services, whether they needed them, wanted them or not. Um, and then we would share those findings with the computer scientists who would try to develop um, systems that were uh, related to the needs and interests of the community. Those projects are always fraught, difficult, and problematic, I think, in one way or another. There's a whole field uh, called ICT4D research, um, which I think is filled with generally very well-intentioned scholars and activists and community workers. But often, we have expectations that when those projects take place, there will be like long-term impacts and changed conditions. And what I have found is that in some cases, when doing this field based research, um, I was on, you know, like coming in after a second generation of scholars had been there and already tried things that didn't work for one reason or another, uh, and then tried to pick up the pieces and deal with kind of the frustration of community members who were saying, Oh, another one of you, why are you here? What are you doing? Can you really help or are you just gonna sort of set something up and leave like the last people? And so sadly, what we see sometimes when you do more, when, when scholars are doing more um, kind of tech oriented projects in developing contexts um, are, you know, they leave behind equipment, it doesn't work, I have a, an article that came out recently where I talk about this um, in, in northern um, Tanzania in the community of Bunda, and I call it infrastructural inertia. Because what happened is a German team came in, they set up this whole Wi-Fi network for uh, uh, the community, and all these towers were up that people could see in their communities every day but they only worked for a few months. And then they, you know, all of this hope and optimism around this international alliance to build this tech and set up this new infrastructure just led to resentment and anger and disappointment. So I think it's difficult when states and corporate entities are not thinking about these communities and then scholars and um, nonprofits go in and try to fill in the gaps and help out, but it often leads to frustration in this condition of infrastructural inertia, where you just see that the community members see the equipment's there, but they know it's not working and they can't use it. And um, so I think the psychic dimensions of this type of research and um, are really complex and, and take time to, to tease out and it's important that we don't put a utopian or euphemistic spin on really complicated material conditions in, in, in these types of contexts. That's, that's really, um, yeah, that's really helpful. And also just really interesting to think about the sort of, that, that the psychic dimension, the frustration, but also those material reminders of disappointed promises and, yeah, that's that's really a powerful image. Gina, did you um, raise your hand and want to get involved? I did. I just want to, to tie in and ask a quick question. And then we have a, a question in the in the Q&A as well. And remind people if you have a question for Lisa, um, ask it now. Um, it just very 
briefly, you know, what I really love about this presentation, Lisa, is that you're calling for a kind of urgency of attention to the relational in our media environments, that this idea of the partialities of global media urge us to think in, um, in very relational terms, how people connect and relate to one another. And in some ways, your, I see your project is really um, rescuing the idea of connection from a, a pretty flattened connection that we have in social media, right? That, that you know, connection will be one way defined in um, a, a, a certain prescribed set of terms. And you are really kind of calling for that in, in a sense of urgency. I wondered if you could take that relational and uh, that sense of urgency around um, coming to this question and go back to that that phrase that you 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 said in the, the talk about how um, you know our infrastructure is so dependent upon electricity, right? That that there's something really vital here that that your work is trying to do about. Um, reconnecting people in a moment when um, the the climate crisis is so um, urgent. You got to my second question. Oh, <laughs> thanks for the question. I was going to energy next. There we go. Let's talk about energy. I people in energy. Yeah, I do think, um, you know, there's different kind of cycles of media scholarship, but there's a tendency for us to think that creative potential occurs in the realm of content. And with social media, you know, we have um, much more templated spaces for expression and communication. And so even though people still are creative with content, what I found in a lot of my work is how creative people were with the hardware. And especially when it came to mm -hmm conditions of energy scarcity and finding ways to repair and reuse um, technologies and, and, and make sure that they were charged so that they could be use, used. So there were informal um, you know, economic organizations like charging services propped up in different communities where an entity that had access to grid power would organize an informal business and pay somebody $30 a month to sit there and charge people's uh, phones. And they would have trust and drop them off. And they had a whole system for um, you know, charging them and redistributing them to people. Um, I also found incredible um, resourcefulness and ingenuity in terms of um, sustainability and repair of devices. People just don't have cash to replace things in the same rates of structured obsolescence that we tend to have in the post-industrial West. And so, um, you know, elaborate businesses are set up in, in Dar es Salaam in the city of the center where people bring their phones to be repaired and rebuilt. And um, the people that I um, observed and met with uh, over time know the inside and outs of most mobile phones on the planet. They know what pieces, they have stocks of spare parts that they've collected. Um, they know what breaks and why. And they had mastered so many different models of um, you know, feature phones, the basic phones without the smartphone features and smartphones that they, a Tanzanian group of, of uh, mobile phone repair men created their own mobile phone design um, based on what they had learned about breakdowns of other devices. And ironically, they wanted to take the design to Foxconn to have them make the first Tanzanian um, mobile phone. Um, so what I'm getting at in responding to your question is just this sense um, of um, us. I, I mean, I think in North America and Europe, it's just, it's really important for us to be aware of the the, the relationality to people who are part of the so-called global media society, but have very different material relationships to these devices. And um, I, uh, it makes me sad when they are, it's most people on the planet and they tend to be left out of understand of a lot of the literature, not all of the literature, but a lot of right. the literature by choosing to focus on particular kinds of formations and entities 
forgets about most people. Um, most people do not have access to grid power on the planet. And yet most people have at least one mobile phone. Um, so there's a lot more research to be done on this and to explore um, also with regard to environmental. I mean, Hunter may be working on these things <laughs> given his expertise in environmental media study. Um, I, I appreciate the, the confidence there. Um, we have a question uh, in the Q&A box that actually adds a sort of temporal dimension to that spatial um, sort of geographical um, issue. Uh, it's a question regarding sort of historicity from Yulia Ron. Uh, Hi, thanks for this very interesting presentation. I'd be interested to know also about the historical grounding of your cases. For example, socialist Yugoslavia was very actively working on computerizing the society, quote, computerizing the society, producing hardware and software and being quite advanced in the field. To what extent the positionality of being outskirts or periphery is something that is itself fluid in time and how do historical legacies shape current media practices and industries? Another question worth an entire seminar or two on its own. Yes, um, thank you for the question. In my case studies, I start the chapters by trying to do some socio-historical contextualization. I think it's extremely important and it's um, challenging for me because each of these sites or milieu could, could be its own massive book length project. And so the challenge for me as a scholar is how to scale down these case studies and set them into dialogue relationally, especially when for many of my readers, they're not going to make much sense in relation to one another. And so I, I have the challenge of establishing the socio-historical context of each site and then combining the multimodal research that and data that I've collected and trying to flesh this out in each of the chapters. Um, so I do appreciate this question because it has not, it, that's why this project is taking me so long because um, it has required a lot of um, contextual and background research. And then um, as a media scholar, I'm not trained um, to have deep cultural competency in each of these mm. sites. So I have had to rely quite a bit on um, partners and locations, on translators, on um, different kinds of modes of investigation, um, and all the while trying to flag my own limits. Um, so so I, I think the question was mostly about contextualization, but there might have been another part that I'm missing. Can you remind me, Hunter, is there another part of it that I should um, address? I know that we're we're running short on time, but there was a question really about sort of how outskirts and periphery is something okay. that's fluid in time. Yeah, okay. I think that was so the... This, you, you, thank you for just uh, zooming right in on this because this is a topic um, that I have gone back and forth about whether outskirts just reinscribes the notion of periphery in a very contrite way. Um, and I went back to the etymology of the term because I was really interested in the late meanings of it, how it could be used to outmaneuver. Um, the outskirt meant to outmaneuver. And that's why I stuck with it because I felt that there was something that I was finding where in these sites, um, people I was talking to and interviewing were, were smarter about media technology than a lot of um, mm -hmm. you know, my colleagues who just like don't know how these things work or wouldn't know how to repair them, um, can theorize the hell out of them, but don't really have a material palpable sense of, of, of um, these machines and these socio-technical contexts. So I stuck with this term and I'm still kind of fleshing it out in the manuscript of the book. And, but I do take the point that, you know, does it just kind of reify the periphery in a way to come up with another metaphor that could be um, synonymous with it? Um, it's something that I'm, I'm reflexive about. So I do appreciate the question coming up. Um, I just think that, you know, maybe there's a need to, to value those peripheries more, these, these sites and, and look at how the kinds of outmaneuvering that's done and to bring that forth further. Um, so thank you for the questions and comments. I, it, it helps me a lot as I'm thinking through this. 
Well, now it's our turn to thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you for a great talk. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you, Hunter, for um, deftly handling uh, the discussion and the questions. And thank all of you um, joining us today, wherever you are. Um, details on our future events can be found on our website, which has, um, um, which will um, appear in the chat. It's um, mctd.ac.uk. Please follow us on Twitter and other social media platforms. Our Twitter handle is at MCTD Cambridge. And our next event is in person only here in Cambridge on Friday, where we will host Francis Haugen, um, the Facebook whistleblower, to discuss trust in digital tech and big tech's role in national security. And that will be with me and with John Naughton. So that promises to be quite exciting. Details of that event for Friday evening in person only in Cambridge can be found on our website. Thank all of you so much. Um, thank you for uh, being a part of our speaker series this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you again. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Take care, everyone.